Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, Pratik just told me before I took the mic that uh, you know you should follow the policy of Elizabeth Taylor. And I was a bit stunned because she's a Hollywood famous Hollywood actress. So I asked him, what, what is that? He said, don't you know, before every marriage, what she said, keep it short. I said, OK, I'll try to keep it short. Thanks, Pratik. All of us realize that um, when we started practice many years ago, we have, were not very familiar with uh, doctors being sued. But now, over a period of time, practice has become very litigious. And uh, it's a standard figure that 70% of all clinical decisions are based on laboratory reports. And uh, indirectly or directly, the laboratory, of course, is involved. And uh, if you remember many years ago, we used to have laboratories which had fixed times. We could call the shots. The patient would come in the morning. We could go for lunch, close the lab in between, come again, tell the patient we close at 7 p.m. sharp. But what has happened is over a period of time, because this particular laboratory medicine has burgeoned so much and there are so many actively involved practicing pathologists, service rules have cha changed. Day and night labs were hardly there before, but now there are day and night labs. Every hospital has a lab, and the patients have become extremely demanding, and they expect the best of services at all times. And their expectations, as I said, is skyrocketed. So we are now in a different position than what we were many years ago. Now, what is our strength? Being part of the medical profession, it is still valued as a noble profession. All said and done, it is still valued. And great strides and advances have been made. And uh, I think all of us, to a large extent, have a goal of benefiting the patient, finally, in our minds. We know that the patient is finally the most valued person who helps us in our practice and whom we can serve. And uh, there is a strong sense of a right and wrong amongst patients these days. They've become very aware of their rights. So we are aware that they are aware. And uh, we keep the Hippocratic uh, oath in our minds, hopefully. And we know how vigilant the press is today, the audiovisual media and the social media. The weaknesses are that more than practicing our craft using our brains, we have now come to rely more on getting trained on mechanized or automated instruments thanks to digitalization. And uh, because of this overexposure in the press and other media, we are really going down in terms of people looking at us with respect. And uh, all, all the medical professionals or healthcare givers are not united. And there is some kind of a professional jealousy which adds to the whole weakness. And uh, there is a kind of no looking at the big picture. People are only looking at what is in it for me. So there is no objectivity. And a high commercialization, especially in a city, first tier city like Mumbai. Maybe it's not so much in the second or third tier cities, but practice, medical practice in cities like Mumbai, Mumbai is highly commercial. And of course, medical record keeping yet is not inculcated completely in standalone labs. When we are talking here, I'm talking as a practicing pathologist with, with a standalone lab. We are not talking about corporate laboratories or high-end laboratories which have laboratory information systems and which have got uh, electronic records. And uh, of course, you know, as we realized, Investment, our practice has become more and more investment based. So obviously when investments are high, people try to cut corners. So you may have less number of staff, you may have pending reports, you may have corrupt uh, pending cases, and uh, lawyers who are corrupt. These are all the weaknesses in our system. So with this background of strength and weaknesses, what is the Indian law scene? Basically, there is no maximum amount for liability that we can be sued on. There's nothing fixed by the government. And uh, the laws are very complicated because even the lawyers are learning about medical practice being litigious and how they can help or not help. In fact, I spoke to a large number of lawyers asking them whether there are any concrete things which they can give me, figures that they have drawn out in the judiciary, but they themselves said it's in a very infant stage. And uh, doctors are soft targets. Obviously, we cannot retaliate like others. And um, 
medical negligence, malpractice, tort, harassment, these are the main things for which the doctor is harassed or brought to court. Now, as we know, the patients have now started becoming extraordinarily active. And uh, they, we all know Google is God, so they Google everything and, you know, they think, uh, they expect us to do what Google has told that we will do. So that becomes a kind of expectation. And they look at us as traders because uh, they think they have a right over us. And uh, there is not the usual, if you remember many years ago, with our general practitioner, the kind of relationship the family shared that was so uh, kind of holy or sacred and uh, you, you literally revered the doctor, but that kind of picture is changing. And uh, with online information and uh, activist group who are just waiting to violate, not only uh, through the press, but even physically violate doctors and assault them, the scene has become really bad. We've already finished this. The thing is that we ourselves are sometimes, I think, not well informed, including me. So what are the MCI guidelines? Have we really gone through it? Do we know it? We don't even know when we are crossing the line and making an error because we are not aware. And uh, the number of lawyers who are there for medical legal aspects is really very, very minimal. And uh, they are really inept, I must say. Now, 3% um, of doctors annually face some issue which is potentially litigious, and this is going to grow by leaps and bounds. 200% is a large number. And between doctors, you know, it's not very easy in our community to share our mistakes for the fear that that may be used against you in the community of doctors itself, and people may look at you with uh, disrespect, and you're worried that your name will be tarnished. So this is an important factor that prevents doctors from coming out into the open about situations. Now, a very heartening figure is that pathologists are the last in the spectrum of doctors who are you know, brought to court. The highest, of course, is the surgical branch of gynec and surgeons, orthopedics. And dermatologists, because that is burgeoned into such a big science and people are looking for results. And it can be just negligence to simple harassment. And uh, the number of cases are also going up in the smaller cities. Um, from 2008 onwards, the number of cases that have come to court and doctors brought to court has been tremendous. And uh, we do not have any system that will be centralized and tracks the number of medical legal cases in the country. So we really don't know how many people are got to court, doctors are got to court, and we may not know in the near future. So what are the things that has caused this boom of doctors being brought as victims most of the time? That is because of the Consumer Protection Act in 1986, which promised redressals in an inexpensive and speedy manner to all consumers. So that gave them uh, a feeling that they could just, if, if they felt the doctor did wrong, they could just go to get their grievance addressed. And then the Right to Information Act, which has uh, the provision that all records have to be uh, given to a person who seeks it in the state and the government uh, center. Sorry. Oops. I'm sorry, I'm going through giving you the whole presentation. Uh, yeah. So in a study of 171 cases that was done, only for pathology, it was found that maximum cases, of course, were for surgical pathology. And cytology was stopped. These are Western uh, world studies. Cytology was stopped by false negative pap, pap smears, followed by breast, thyroid, and lung. And maximum clinical pathology litigations were in blood bank, and finally a small percentage in lab reports. Now let's just go through some of the case scenes where we all could be potential victims for uh, being sued in court. Now cytology, 42-year-old 
female diagnosed as categorically breast carcinoma on FNAC, but surgical specimen did not reveal any evidence of tumor, and it was a modified radical mastectomy. Now here, um, the pro thing is, when you're not sure, it's always better to recommend another procedure that keeps you safe in court. You can say strongly suspicious or suggestive of, but if you're not sure, it's better to say that a frozen section or a true cut or uh, confirmatory tissue diagnosis be done. Because this can be a real potential breaker or a game changer in your practice. Now, surgical pathology, uh, there was this 51-year-old male who had uh, come for uh, torsion testes. I mean, he was diagnosed as uh, infarction due to torsion. And uh, many years later, he landed up with a metastasis. And actually, what happened was that uh, it was necrosis in a tumor that was diagnosed as uh, infarction. And the patient, uh, the slides were re-examined and it was found that actually it was a malignant uh, tumor. And of course, the patient had every right to say that because of the delay and because of the non-accurate uh, you know, um, diagnosis, he had to suffer. So, in fact, um, the urologist and the pathologist both were uh, taken to court and uh, punished. Another case is of a circumcision specimen in an adult. Now, circumcision, usually very often it comes uh, even as a routine when it is done, not necessarily with the pathology. And there was a little uh, lesion that was seen on gross, but it was not inked during uh, surgery or after surgery by the surgeon. And uh, diagnosis of in situ carcinoma was made by the pathologist. And the urologist did not perform a wide excision because the pathologist uh, did not caution him and talk to him or communicate with him. And uh, later on, the person developed carcinoma at the site of surgery. Here also both the urologist and the pathologist were sued. So when does, why do errors occur in surgical pathology? It can occur when you yourself are not thinking rightly because maybe you are not aware. Maybe you have started reporting a case and uh, you quit the job or maybe you go on leave and somebody else takes it up so the continuity is lost. And sometimes we tend to invalidly assume a lot of things which may not be the assumption without asking the clinician or talking to the patient in many cases. And over-reliance on immunohistochemistry, doing things which are not relevant to the case and a fear of consulting a peer or a colleague for, be, for fear of feeling that you are inadequate in knowledge. Oh, what will that person think? I can't diagnose even this much. So that fear is one thing which prevents people from consultation of peers and not following upgraded standard protocols which keep changing all the time. And of course, most important is updating of knowledge. So... Wherever there are possibilities of recurrent lesions, one should be very vigilant and do all possible things and leave no stone unturned so that the patient doesn't come back with the same pathology and you have not warned the patient or the clinician. And keep in mind mimics of malignancies. And I think taking a second opinion is one of the most important things and doing an appropriate IHC whenever you feel there is a doubt. Because for a standalone lab, cost is an important factor. Now, for example, if a patient comes uh, with a TURP specimen, how much do we charge? 1,500 maybe, if it's a large prostate, and then it's doubtful. Then you have to do an IHC. So it becomes difficult, but you have to do it, and the patient can always be informed about it. So the fear of increasing charges should not be a deterrent for you not to do IHC. It's very important because you need to be putting on paper the final diagnosis, especially if it's a malignancy that is, uh, you know, low grade, you need to do it. And uh, when uh, surgical pathology reports are being given, 
it's all right for us to go on and on and describe and uh, give nice looking lengthy reports but what the surgeon is looking for is simple terms that he can understand so we need to get into the habit i think of uh, using surgeon friendly terms like for example in urothelial bladder carcinomas if you say the tumor cells are uh, surrounded by smooth muscles well a busy surgeon could think that it is deep muscle or detrusor invasion and just go for very radical surgery. So you need to be very specific that there is no deep muscle invasion. It is the superficial muscle that is involved. And as you know, uh, we need to preserve tissue blocks for 10 years. And uh, photographs are a good way of preserving. And now with digital archiving that has come into the scene, we need not... Uh, preserve these space occupying lesions and Philips I think has got a very good system. It is very expensive, maybe bigger hospitals are doing it and it's easy to access records that are many decades old as well. Now once again we come back to cytology, preserving slides uh, is a problem so it's better to take photomicrographs. And now there was this lymph node FNAC and uh, it was reported as tuberculous, again based on the necrosis. And uh, the second opinion was taken and that was reported as malignancy. It was a metastatic carcinoma. So actually this happened in Mumbai in one of the suburbs and uh, the pathologist is a good friend of mine so we could talk. And the pathologist was threatened but not sued. But it was a potential situation for lawsuit and you know the mental harassment one can go through it affects your day-to-day -day practice and you can't really then uh, function normally. So this was a necrosis kind of thing. And even in tuberculosis, when uh, we report uh, FNACs, it will be a very good idea to suggest gene expert or a tissue diagnosis or at least say do microbiological studies and use words like recommended for final confirmatory diagnosis so that you are safe. And uh, like today morning, we heard uh, the talk by Dr. Amita Joshi, where she men mentioned non-tubercular mycobacteria. So it could well be possible that when we do the AFB, we are looking at non-tubercular mycobacteria, and the overzealous uh, clinician might uh, just start treatment. And considering the toxic nature, it's better. Now, this is a clinical pathology scene which happened at one of the hospitals where I was. Um, we reported a high potassium and a low calcium and uh, the clinician uh, was he really jumped out of his skin and he said there's a young fellow who's come for hydrocele he's walking around what have you reported we repeated it and it came high so we sent it for external quality control and uh, inter uh, sent it to another report uh, took a fresh sample and sent it to another lab and the report was normal so I uh, took the original container in which the sample was collected and literally had a grilling session with the technician and what we learned was that actually he had collected it in a potassium EDTA bulb and then quickly transferred it to a plain bulb and uh, obviously the potassium was high and uh, the calcium was low because of uh, chelation. So these are situations where, uh, you know, we need to just have that little alarm in our head and make an inquiry and make a big noise about it in the lab and find out what has happened. And the thing is, like for example, if a surgeon is involved, it is the surgeon who has to take the brunt. Here we have to take the brunt, but it is a whole team who is working. It could well be somebody else's error, but finally the buck stops with us. Now, telepathology also has got a lot of uh, legal implications. There is no set law as yet in our country, but in a lot of other countries like in the US or Japan where it is very actively practiced, it is uh, considered not as a patient-doctor relationship. It is considered as a doctor-to-doctor -doctor practice. So the nature of the litigious aspect is not the same. Now, one thing about telepathology is we try to always hide the identity of the patient, try to quote the patient, uh, you know, take, if we send pictures of the patient or any information, take the con consent of the patient. And uh, we don't have a registration for telemedicine in our country, but the European Union has a registration. 
and uh, whenever telemedicine is being practiced or telepathology the person who is signing it should be an agreement which is drawn out a mou where you decide whether it is a person who is showing you the slide or the person who is signing is going to take the final uh, you know so there are two things here now for example in japan if it is a real time viewing and both of them are seeing at the same time with a live remote control then the interpreting pathologist takes the brunt of the diagnosis and if it is a stored and forwarded image which is being sent then the person who has sent you the stored and forwarded image he takes the brunt because that is the only material that is given to the pathologist who is finally going to sign the report and give the diagnosis now we all know this uh, even if we have woken up at sleep now at the end of the conference we know pre analytical and analytical and post so um, sampling errors are the most important stage where mistakes occur now for example you have a biopsy that does not extract tumor cells you have a cytology that is blood uh, you know full of blood and not, not representative and blood drawn in the wrong container or mix up with another patient sample we are talking about stand alone labs medium labs we are not talking about corporate barcoded automated laboratories so we need to specify rejection criteria very strictly with the people who are sending us the sample as to what are the collection containers culture containers and not report ill preser preserved surgical specimens so say that they are autolyzed or poorly fixed or inadequately fixed without the fear of you know what will they think whether they'll send me work abhi kya karu these things shouldn't come in your head at all you have to talk to the person and report it the way it is so we need to design pre and post analytical stages and always communicate with the clinicians now new tests like for example um, we were told about that uh, new test in uh, hepatocellular uh, carcinoma now the clinician wouldn't know what it is so we would have to talk to him and explain the limitations as well and how to communicate results we all know critical results are to be communicated immediately without waiting for the time and interpretation sometimes can be a problem we need to interpret the reports also in a very clear fashion to the clinician so as to enable him document 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 most important thing and um, we should have some idea of the litigation process and um, how to handle something like this be mentally prepared so that you are all the time on a vigil and you don't commit mistakes and as we know we need to for every stand alone laboratory you need to have stat very standard procedures and uh, see that you reinforce the procedure time in and time out and adopt the guidelines and as i always say consulting a colleague will not cost you much not consulting the colleague will cost you a lot and after the reports are over reconfirming patient details we are uh, you know if you go to a laboratory say maybe in a second tier city or in the interiors they may just write the name of the patient without the surname so common names can easily lead to wrong reports being given to patients reconfirm transcription confirm the right report to the right patient and uh, be sure that the interpretation is very clear when you sign the report so this is in places where the laboratory information systems are not in place a bidirectional interface online data transfer and barcoding if it is in place these chances of errors are less likely see ba basically the bottom line is that the patient deserves quality and we need to remember that uh, we took up medicine to serve the patient and finally uh, you know you need to empathize with them you need to establish rapport with them what is it that is now different between a technician run lab and our lab what is our usp that basically we are physicians but we forget that we have also begun to behave like technicians we have started behaving like traders and that you know very holy act of talking to the patient 
asking them something about what is wrong with them or whether they are taking any medicines, that itself is enough PR for us to get more patients. Because that they come to you with that and, you know, of course, preventive healthcare patients are healthy. But most of the patients are in distress when they come to us, as we all know. So we need to have a very good quality management system in place. Be very aware of risks and be always open to second opinion and criticism. And it is, uh, I think, uh, crucial for us to keep reinforcing in ourselves that we need to be patient, not to react to patients, be calm, tell them you understand their problem, and very often humbly accept when the mistake is obvious. That will many times be the only reason why the patient didn't go to court. They think, okay, you know that probably the doctor's intent was not bad. They have been to the lab so many times, the doctor has been so nice and always inquiring and, uh, you know, really like a doctor. So maybe I'll just not sue this doctor. That could be the only reason why you may not be sued. And it's a good idea to have professional indemnity. So say what you do and uh, I think do what you say and prove it. And we really cannot afford to forget our moral ab obligations day in and day out, every day at the lab. We need to remember we are physicians, we are health caregivers, we are not technicians. I think then that will solve a lot of problems. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions, please?
But is it justified in putting a footer for each and every case of reactive? Well, this is a very difficult question to answer because we don't have NHS, we don't have the government paying for us, and everybody comes from a different class. Whoever comes to a station, so we cannot generalize. It's a very difficult situation. I think what you should write is that so you found it reactive. Say it is reactive. Clinical correlation suggesting. Let the surgeon also. I mean, you have a no result. You have found what you have found. For a case of tuberculous lymphadenitis, the pathology. What weird studies are during our period is cases include Zangen giant cells and epithelial granulomas is sufficient to label it as a tuberculous lymphadenitis on a histopath. But I think there are some new guidelines after this lot of tuberculosis uh, surveillance has come into role that uh, on a ZN stain AFP has to be demonstrated till then you cannot label it as a tuberculosis. Yeah, lymphadenitis. but ZN stain may show negative as she said today if it's less than 10,000 per ml. Then in that case, uh, some amount of the fresh bit has to be sent for gene export. Right. But then as a or for but, but does that mean that the new guidelines prevent the histopathologist from reporting that as tuberculous lymphadenitis or he should report it as a necrotizing lymphadenitis suggestive of pox and then advise yes. tissue culture? Suggestive of mycobacterial origin. Okay. Suggest so, so the basic terminology of tuberculous lymphadenitis as such is, is oxidic. Or even report, we used to report it as pox. Pox. Correct. All those things yes. are not there. Not there. Specimens. 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 We can preserve for about five, like five months. Five months. Is there a See, you have already taken the representative blocks and you have the blocks with you or there with the picture. So it doesn't make sense to preserve the whole specimen for longer than six months. I mean, it's here, potassium, as you said, uh, especially these uh, standalone labs who receive uh, samples from the hospitals, we have seen that the high potassium comes and they collect the samples at night, keep it in the fridge and next day morning they send for it. We, we do not know when the sample is being collected. We will write in our data entry as sample received as a time of collection. And then we come up with high potassium of 7, yeah, sometimes 8. Sometimes they take it the, from the same hand as the drip. Because there are no labs open around, they keep it in the refrigerator for the next day. So whenever, and then they yeah, send the sample. Because whenever the samples you have written, you have received the sample from outside. So it depends. You can add a line there. Yes, uh, there are two important announcements, but uh, before that I would request uh, ma'am to kindly accept this token of appreciation. Thank you.